Bon appetit to everybody. I hope you guys enjoyed your meal. And hopefully we say something and show you guys stuff here that blows your mind away. So anyway, um, we're going to talk about partial gland ablation in the context of certainty. And a lot of what is said in the meeting, you know, I'm not going to cover since we have all these personalities here. These are my disclosure statements. And <clears throat> we're going to go quickly through all these issues. Why alternative management paths are required, the, per the pervasive uncertain bias that shrouds prostate cancer, how they are thinking evolved over the last uh, 10 years, partial gland ablation under a certain paradigm where you know where the lesion is, then transperineal ablation, whether it's cryo, and, and we will talk about a clinical trial running on laser, and some final thoughts. So why are we here? It's very simple, right? We know about the rise of cancer and also um, the unfortunately decline in screening that has led to the, uh, basically 100% rise in the incidence of metastatic disease over the last 10 years. And the fact that you, we, we are in a bipolar world where you either do surveillance or you do treatment, there's like no middle ground. And a lot of that has to do with, um, with the, with the three clinical trials that show between observation and surgery and the last one from the British on radiation showing no significant benefit in overall survival. So we're an evolving trend going towards uh, partial gland ablation and there's many uh, elements of technology that need to be involved as we know and there's many sources of energy coming in, cryo, HIFU, laser, IRE to cut everything. We have focused to do this procedures in the office setting. One of the need for focal therapy is the fact that most of the if not all, most of the active surveillance patients will convert within a window of five years for all kinds of reasons. And then they will go the um, path of radical treatments with the consequences that bring. So when we think about partial gland ablation or some, some, some people call it super after surveillance, we have to look into what elements that are, are important in this discussion, right? And there's a nice paper written by Laurie during the pandemic that I highly recommend where he does a very thorough uh, analysis of all the partial gland ablation methods included there, all the patients that they analyzed in this paper. And again, it looks at the incontinence rates by energy source or the erectile dysfunction rates. And we should come to terms in when, that when we do partial gland ablation, there should be certain outcomes that are not uh, tolerable, like incontinence. And we need to have a high bar when it comes to erectile function. It can be low. Right, so what kinds of uh, adverse events can be seen? I mean, the presence of fistula if you're doing targeted therapy should be zero. This is not when you do cryo or HIFU, it's not those treatments of the past when you did the entire gland. So all this is well explained in that paper. So my history with partial gland ablation starts about nine years ago when we wrote a protocol to evaluate not only the, the path of how to do this, but how to do it in a certain way, in a most precise way. This is the world that we had back then 10 years ago when the FDA basically gave screening a D recommendation and the, and, and what, and the cascade of harm that was triggered technically by screening. But the, and we were living in a bipolar world, you either take the prostate out or not, and I done myself close to 2,000 robotic prostatectomies, so I'm a sinner of the first kind. But the problem with the way we do diagnosis, and a lot was discussed today, is the fact that we're doing it transrectally and in this fashion, right, we don't know for certain, certain limits of the land and what the, the story. So at the end of the day, you, we use clinical tools such as biological signatures or longitudinal studies or the fact that, that we know that people with surveillance, most of them do well, some not. Or we use now the imaging with uh, MRI and we try to, try to understand or try to remove that uncertainty that brings a lot of bias, okay? Uh, map biopsies. That bias transforms itself in, into um, uh, negative outcomes. This, for example, is a paper out of a, what we did a memorial years ago, looking mm -hmm. at the outcomes of patients from several surgeons. And this slide is just to show you the variability among the surgeons, and that engloses a lot of things, right? So we began this chase for a paradigm of certainty. And in that, we wrote a protocol that was ample with plenty of inclusion criteria so we can have events. And events will tell us the story and we can follow that over the years. So that, that is uh, running. And, and the slides are showing you, you know, the kind of characteristic. The most critical parts here were quality of life outcomes measured regularly and a biopsy 
uh, MRI guided fusion at a year. And this is the very first patient that I treated with partial gland ablation using cryotherapy back in 2013. And you could see how his PSA behaved and then eventually this man needed a chirp. He had an 80 gram prostate years down the road, but he's been doing great ever since, okay? A lot of what we do has to do with a, with a, with a system and methods uh, patent that I wrote and was recently approved in the United Kingdom and here in the United States. And the state waters our vision in terms of the management of this disease. And when we look at it, the way that we look at the lesions is to understand the paradigm. So we want to know where they are. We want to sample it in the same axis that we will treat them, okay? So once we know where the tumors are, like it's showing in that little video, then it's easy to formulate the treatment plan. We do this through some proprietary algorithms that we can actually understand where are we going to go, and then this treatment is performed in the office setting under local anesthesia, which allows the physicians to be productive and then see patients in between and do other things. One of the best weapons is, is one of the strategic partner of ours that we have been developing in AI and all this RN and all these MRIs were read by a computer showing the suspicious areas and then this gets uh, outlined and co-registered into our system and this is how this works. So we have a level of suspicion the radiologist goes over and basically uh, approves or disapproves what they're seeing and from there we formulate the plan that's going into the uh, fusion system so the biopsy can be performed. And this is typically what we want to know. We want to know where the lesion is. We want to know the pores that are positive. We want to know the pores that are negative. The, the, the way we are accurate and do, and, do uh, uh, and we are certain is that it starts with a fusion system. It was actually developed at the University College of London where it accounts for the deformation of the prostate. As, as it goes. So the fusion is done in the system by reloading in the MRI information and the plan is already in sight. So there's very little room for, you know, I want to change this or change that. You can do it, of course, but there's already a track in place. There's a highway set up for you. So you can do this in an expeditious manner. And then that plan goes into the modeling inside and that then the next step is to really do the co-registration, which the only thing you need to do is understand how the prostate looks and, and essentially what's the outline. And then the system does the magic, putting them together and telling you exactly where you should go in order to get your sampling. And then eventually, when you know your samples and you know which ones are positive and which ones are negative, it's very easy to, for we have all those that formulate the treatment plan. So you go using the same system, using the same axis, you go in and then you do this in the office setting under general, under, sorry, under local anesthesia, okay? So these are examples of plans that we do. On the case on the left is, is a typical prostate, how we oversample that, that was a PRS3, that ends up only having one core, and then it's difficult to tell patients I'm gonna watch you when I know exactly where the tumor is and I understand their boundaries. So many of them, and you don't have the same harm uh, that with focal therapy or targeted therapy that you can have with, um, with uh, prostatectomy radiation. So this is essentially the amount of cases that we've been doing over the years and we're really uh, recognizing that this is expanding beyond cryo, we're doing laser and there's other treatment uh, modalities that we're gonna be doing. Back in, in early 2002, we did an analysis of the data of over a thousand uh, patients treated, uh, of which about 76% of them were just targeted therapies with one year plus biopsies, and about 1,412 of them for which we found infield recurrences or proven infield recurrences in 15% of the overall sample, um, and a third of the ones that we did the biopsy. The, 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 there were many of them that did not have a biopsy because their PSA were either flat or they did not have a rising PSA. And this is the, the, the study that we put at the AUA. Uh, basically, this was going to be uh, discussed during the year of the pandemic in 2020. But essentially, what we found is that at one year, the MRI performed one year after the biopsy is the most important predictor of that positive biopsy. So if that MRI is negative, meaning it has no pyrats lesions in the areas that were not treated, and there's no enhancement in the areas that were treated, you, and your PSA is flat, you don't need to really repeat the biopsy. This is uh, an important plot because we had over now over 100 patients that have 
accomplish a five-year milestone. And basically, we have not been able to see any, number one, the first story is that the rate of conversion to surgical radiation is less than 10%, and it has not correlated with the Gleason scores that they had when we went in. Granted, we have a 75% population that are either 3 plus 3 or 3 plus 4 or better. This is what to expect with the PSA. It's interesting, the power that PSA has in alleviating anxiety when men see a level in this, it, for us, the median has been 6.4, dropping to 1.7. And that's enough. I mean, coming from surgery, I always thought, you know, you need to see your PSA on zero. I was wrong. So with this data on board, we met at uh, the focal meeting from the Focal Therapy Society back in Washington just before the pandemic with people of CLS. And we started thinking about a clinical trial that could evaluate the use of laser, the feasibility, whether we could do it in the office setting. And the Tramberg laser, which is done by, T T uh, by CLS, is 1,064 nanofiber. It fits perfectly through the grids. And the laser has been used in over 250 patients, most, most of them really in bore. And I believe in the United States, it's exclusively in bore. The paper by Feller, I highly recommend it, published in the journal Urology in, uh, in 2020, really explains the outcomes associated with MBOR MRI-guided laser in patients in treatment naive and, and, and salvage of them. And the key there is that the SHIM scores remain constant, the PSS scores or, or urinary quality of life improves, and then a lot of their patients, a big majority, will have a negative biopsy. The, the, the Tramberg laser is the laser fiber, of course, and then you need a troker and an introducer for which you advance the, 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 the management. So what we uh, proposed was to do this under fusion in the office setting, again, under general anesthesia. Our protocol was written and accepted by the IRB. We got approved end of March, and we recruited our first patient in August, uh, on April uh, 14th, and now we're almost done with this. It called for 20 patients, and it calls for a man between 50 and 80, prostate volumes less than basically 100, with the characteristic shows on the MRI. We, the key things about this study is that patients get an MRI immediately after the treatment, they get an MRI a month later, they get an MRI three months later, and essentially they get PSA measurements at the same time, and they get oncological assessments, okay? So the primary outcomes are facey, feasibility and safety of laser fusion, accuracy of the fusion platform in, in, in really uh, doing what it's intended to do, and the primary con oncological control will be at 12 months with a transperineal fusion biopsy. Then we're looking at perioperative outcomes, urinary function, sexual outcomes, imaging outcomes, and of course, long term, we will see what happens with these folks as these patients will enroll into a registry that we have under uh, the Urological Research Network. So this is what you need. You need a fusion platform, an ultrasound machine with a bipolar probe and a stepper, and again, the fusion platform. And this is essentially how we do this. I mean, this is a transperineal block. We start by blocking the skin on each side to the rafe. We use roughly, uh, we tend to use 10 cc's of lidocaine 1%. This is being cut down now significantly because we're using uh, sublingual fentanyl, Vesuvia, and that really takes the pain to zero. After that, we pull the stepper, we put in the, um, neuro, the periprostatic block, as is shown in this video, and then we go ahead and do the actual treatment. And uh, I'll spend a couple minutes on this video. We once we have the patient block and ready, we advance the Foley catheter, we leave it in place. We don't need to cool anything off unless, you know, we know the lesions are close to the urethra. In that situation, we'll put a three-way fold and basically irrigate it when we're applying the energy close to there. But the, fusions, the first thing that happens, you acquire the imaging into the fusion system. And then essentially in the fusion system, you put the boundaries of the prostate. You say, what's the apex, what's the base, a few spots here and there of the boundaries of the prostate. And then the magic really comes in. This was developed by Dean Barrett out of UCL. Uh, the embarrassed team in the bioengineering um, department, and essentially it provides an algorithm that will basically do the fusion, and it's this type of deformable fusion we're talking, so now we know where we're going. The characteristics for this specific patients are listed on the right side of the panel. And now in real-time mode, we know where we're gonna go. So essentially this patient calls for four laser applications. Each application, okay, is uh, at, eight vol uh, at eight watts, and it lasts about 3.3 3 .3 minutes. So 
if we want to do this accurately, one of the things that you need is really a grid that corresponds to where we're telling you where you need to go. So you need to go C 3.0 and then you put the probe. Then each laser fiber will be different uh, depending on the manufacturer. So for the CLS laser fiber, the, the energy starts at the tip and it goes backwards for roughly 18 millimeters to two centimeters. And here, the laser fiber is right on the dot where you want to be, again, it's all about precision and you start applying the energy in about a minute or a minute and a half, you will start seeing this effect. You can put it on your Doppler on the ultrasound machine and you will see that energy really, which represents this vapor for the, from the tissues that are being ablated. Here we go now, this, the next applications in the same axis, a little bit lower and you see the, you see the burn, let's put it this way, that's occurring, the, the tissues getting ablated. And after that, essentially we follow the plan through until the procedure finished. This particular procedure took less than 20 minutes. So this is what happened with this guy. So after we have the plan, we got the immediate MRI, and you can see the ablation that corresponds pretty well with what was intended. And then at a month, look how that looks. Okay, and then three months later is where you really start seeing the shrinkage of the prostate and the shrinkage of the treated area. So his prostate volume pre-treatment was around 51. It went all the way up to 65 because there's more inflammation so for the radiologist to do the segmentation is a little bit more challenging and we got four of them working at this uh, at, in every case and then you can see how the PSA behaves really doesn't change in the first month but then starts dropping this is three months later on this patient these are other examples of targeted ablations that we have conducted under the study and I hope that by the AUA time we have complete accrual and we'll present three months results on all of them so this is essentially another patient. You can look here what happened at the plan, the execution, the immediate MRI, how it looks then in the mesh and how that lesion shrinks and the prostate just three months later, okay? So how do we get this consistent outcomes? Well, it has to do what's happening there is what our algorithms do. So what's important is not only where the positive biopsies are, but where the negative biopsies are. And then, we, then that generates a treatment area that we want and how we're best going to do that. We, if we do it with cryo, which is all teed up, then it tells us for this particular patient, this is where your probes go and this is how you're going to achieve that ablation. So again, there's a lot of pitfalls for partial gland ablation that we have to overcome. The perception of, of incontinence and fistulas that's associated with whole gland treatments and that's what people see on the internet. But as meetings like that flows, people understand that we're not completely destroying the prostate, that we're far away from that. That the energy has to be delivered transperineally. Transrectal energy delivery always makes me a little bit worried. And we need to avoid the heterogeneity of outcomes because that will be the case of death for focal therapy. So the case for partial gland ablation, what, you know, we feel that the index tumor really is the driver, but like was discussed today, if you have other smaller tumors that may be more high risk, there's no problem in treating those. Multifocality can be addressed, and the MRI identifies lesions 85 to 90% of the time. So it's about preserving quality of life and destroying or stopping the tumor. So what I tell patients, and I stole some of this lines from Dr. Lepore's talk last year at the Lopka meeting, I tell them that the tumors will be destroyed, that we're not burning any bridges, so the other options are always available. That I'm very confident that their quality of life will improve because in the cryo series we've seen a 70% improvement in IPSS scores and in flow rates, both subjectively and objectively. And I stress that the cancer may come back, that a year MRI biopsy is likely warranted, but they may need a retouch if they have an outfield recurrence that's small or they have a, let's say, uh, that's manageable, they're the first one who's going to ask you that. And I want to finish with this couple of slides that I was told actually from Andy Stevenson, we talk a lot about this, and you know, is, the, is, the, is, the, is essentially <clears throat> the, the innovator dilemma, Christian Christensen, is where he talks about how, how things change. So we were talking today, uh, Dr. Emberton was talking about what's going to happen over the next 20 years. Well, open surgery was dominant, and then robotic came in and basically shipped everything. Okay, because it was shorter length of stay, no blood loss, etc. We know all the goods. I think robotic surgery has its days, the, the plenitude of that, at least for prostate cancer on the way down. And that actually the new disrupted therapy is ablation. And the fortunate part about this is that it's not going to be a single form of energy. There's going to be several of them, as you can see in this meeting. We have 
water vapor, we have HIFU, we have cryo, we have laser. So that's what's going to make also a difference. So we hopefully will build all this in lines of clinical trials. So my prediction is that, you know, one of the elements uh, that I failed to mention is that when you do transperineal biopsies, your cancer detection rate goes from 30% to 50%, and you don't have to deal with infections and things like that. So I believe that we will be diagnosing more prostate cancers, but more of these biopsies will be managed with focal therapy or targeted ablation. And your one out of 10 may require conversion to surgery or, 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 or radiation. One out of 10 may require retouch. But we need to start screening our men again because what's worse than, than the conversions is the rates of metastatic disease. And that has doubled from 2012 to 2020. Thank you very much.